Hi and welcome, I'm Tommy Holst and this is the Dropcast Movie Poster Podcast. This format is part of the Instagram blog Drop and you can find us under at DropMakeOfficial. We do reviews, news and interviews that all have to do with the film business. And in this show we will talk to the great Greg Ruth, who is a comic book and movie poster artist who did a lot of stuff for Mondo and his own uh, book series with Ethan Hawke. And we also will talk about how he got inspired to all do this great art. So stay tuned and head over to our Instagram profile at DropMakeOfficial to follow along with the art we are talking about and check us out on YouTube for the video version. Now let's get started. So I have today one of the greatest artists in the movie poster scene with me, um, Mr. Greg Ruth. How are you doing, sir? Hi, how are you, Tom? I'm pretty good. I mean, the weather is nice. So we talked about that and you had snow, I heard. So that's uh, that's a crazy, yeah. crazy thing. But yeah. um, I mean, having snow means you have a lot of time to work. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one way to look at it, for sure. <laughs> yeah, winter survival kits. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, first off, before we start off with like the real interview, I have uh, three art pieces I want to talk about. Okay. And uh, our first one that we are going to talk about is the um, Parasite uh, hymn version, because uh, it is very dear to me and yeah. the people can see it now as well. And um, I like both. But how did you how did how did this happen? How did it come about? Uh, let me think that was, it's funny because this was probably started back last April. Um, Parasite, I think had just won con mm -hmm. and, um, the, uh, Christian and Mike at neon had gotten in touch saying that they were looking for, to do a real Oscar push, a big rollout here in the States. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh they wanted some artwork to go with it we originally i think had the idea of just doing one piece but it grew into a, a pair as we realized the first one landed so well we we decided it made more sense to have a kind of a him her uptown downtown kind of um kind of pairing happening between the two of them <clears throat> uh, I think what really got them, uh, got me on their radar was a Twin Peaks piece I had done mm -hmm. uh, for a gallery show and then a poster series through Mondo. We did a whole bunch, like 60 different prints, but there was a giant poster <clears throat> yeah. of Kyle MacLachlan's Special Agent Cooper with kind of an inverted um, Great Northern Hotel and all of that kind of stuff. And they really just really uh, caught into that design. Mm -hmm. Normally, I, 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 I blanch when there's a call to, you know, when they, uh, it happens a lot. People will see something they like, they want you to do that for them. I, I tend to try to avoid repeating uh, themes as much as I can. Um, but, you know, sometimes you can't. They were really uh, eager for it. It was something that I think if it had had a contradictory theme to the design, I would have pushed harder against it. But mm -hmm. it worked made a lot of sense with how um i saw um the character and the kind of duality of the two worlds that he lived in or, or wished that he aspired to so it kind of worked out um we went right to a quick thumbnail sketch they loved it bong really liked it as well um immediately i think upon that sketch and the initial drawing of it that's when they had the idea to do a second one we okay did. Yeah, I'm gonna um, pull. I'm gonna pull that up real quick for the others to see. It's now on, and um, yeah, it's the the her version. Why did you decide for her character? Uh, well, we were we did a lot of talk about. Uh, I think that the underlying kind of modes of each were were who they were and what they aspired towards. What what kind of lived is their kind of centerpiece of their dream, and she kind of lived in this kind of gilded kind of cage, but this kind of inconsequential dream world filled with fruit and kind of opulence and flowers and you see a lot of that mm -hmm. and her little obsession with the dog and her son and his kind of uh kind of oblivious racist indian obsessions as a child that mm -hmm. he was doing so all of that kind of played uh into key i think i had originally had some blood splatter on some of the fruit and some of the flowers and it just was a little bit too on the nose mm -hmm. it's it's easy to go too far and to to slap too hard um and so i tend to try to pull back uh from that a little bit when it makes sense there's certain subjects or certain films or certain um uh ideas where a hard slap really works you know a real mm -hmm. punch in the face kind of image makes sense this was not that so 
um, there was a lot of kind of overextending and then kind of walking back a little bit. But I think that still gets us further than if I just stayed in a kind of a safe zone with it. So uh, yeah. that was kind of what was behind it. And how, how was the how was your feeling when uh, when you saw it as a billboard piece for uh, the, the especially the hymn version? That was crazy. I I had no idea they were doing that. They were mm -hmm. being very coy about how they were going to use the pieces. We knew that they were making some kind of lobby cards that they were going to give out at theaters and some and they did a beautiful mm -hmm. um, eighteen by twenty four print set with it's all embossed and nice. The billboard was I had no idea. So the first time I saw it was when they sent me that picture of. Um, of when, Bong and Cass yeah. mm -hmm. in front of it in Los Angeles, and it just it just blew my hair back. There's no question. <laughs> yeah, that's really that's that's a really that's a great uh, that's a great way. And I mean, he uh, seems to very appreciate uh, the artwork. And uh, did you see the film before, or how, how? I I they had sent me a screener back okay. in April. So yeah, okay. I always I have to see the film, and I and I yeah. have to I basically kind of for anything, whether it's a Criterion project or a Mondo piece. Mm -hmm. I'll just sit and watch the film once just to let it happen and see mm -hmm. what ideas spark from it. And then once um, I get kind of a catalog of notions down, I'll, I'll jot them down while I'm watching that first pass. And then that's when I'll go back and start kind of cutting the film up and looking at it over pieces. And generally I'll see a film for something like this anywhere from two to six times in a session just in different pieces altogether. Mm -hmm going through again and again and again, um, just to kind of make sure that details are correct, that that I'm not missing stuff. There's mm -hmm. certain films that it's all kind of right there on the surface and it's easy to kind of jump to. Films like this, Parasite's very, it's a very dense thing all the way down into its most yeah. kind of hidden subtlety. So there was a lot, I think I must have had to see that film at least a half a dozen times before May to really get a, get a sense of Picking the right images. I mean, there's so many places you can go visually for that. Um, mm -hmm. For that movie, it was it was hard to. It was hard. I think it would have been harder to land on an image had they not already kind of come in with a kind of a predetermined design idea that they wanted mm -hmm. to chase. So in a lot of ways, that leash allowed it kind of limited my options in a way that made it very easy to navigate that kind of other stuff. Okay, uh, that's kind of how it came together. Cool. And uh, since you've seen the movie uh, that much, uh, could you rate the movie on a scale from zero to ten? Because I do like uh, from a usual blog, I do a lot of movie and TV show uh, reviews, and I right. gave the film I think a nine point five or ten. So yeah. <laughs> no pressure it's there. It's definitely yeah, it's definitely in ten zone. I'm a huge fan of Bong's, and I've loved his films ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, someone kind of chokingly forced me to watch this movie I'd never seen before called um, The Host, and I yeah. was blown away by that film um, and I've been in love with his work ever since and going through his back catalog and then the oak jaw and snow piercer and things mm -hmm. that happened post the host um, yeah I it's it's clearly his he seems to have brought to bear for parasite all the tools and the kind of honed weaponry and narrative storytelling uh, mm -hmm. chops that he gained from all of his other projects they seem to all kind of come into play here I see bits and pieces yeah. of all of his catalog in this thing. This is definitely a kind of a, yeah, a it's magnum his... opus for him. Yeah, exactly, really... exactly. It's, it's, it's peak, peak uh, bong. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it's absolutely the, the most amazing thing. It's such a hard thing to do something like this, I think, for an artist like him. And then, because immediately that follows, everything gets compared to it as mm -hmm. whether it's better or worse. It's a terrible thing to have to follow up a, a, a something like this and the, the kind of runaway success of it, um, the Oscar wins, all of that kind of, yeah. I think they were dizzy from it for, and probably still are. It was, <laughs> yeah. It's a weird thing to have to chase your next film after this. And exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, speak of magnum opus, do, would you consider uh, one of your pieces is your magnum opus? Or in terms of what the fans are saying, maybe? I, I don't know. I, I There's been a few pieces over time that have kind of, kind of hit the right notes with people and keep cropping up going way back to stuff I did for the matrix or freaks of the heartlands yeah. first issue cover. Um, I don't really know. And I don't kind of think of my work that way. I don't know that it's healthy um, okay. for artists to see their work as critics or the outside public 
does and should. It's not, I don't mean to downplay the way that others see your work, but I don't think the tools and the kind of cataloging that come mm -hmm. from making your work are the same as they would be in how people see, perceive, and rate your work. So to me, they're like, it's like asking me to name my favorite child. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Not all turned out as I'd hoped. Some of them <laughs> got better than I thought, but my love for them is equal to all. And I, I don't know, I don't know how you, there's no way to, there's no way to highlight one as superior without me immediately thinking of four other things that are now being degraded as a result of that false comparison. So I, I don't yeah, yeah. I, I know it was a mean, it was a mean question. <laughs> Yeah. It's a long way around to just say, I, I don't do that. I don't know. But um, this was definitely one that a lot of people, the, the Parasite piece definitely took off in a really huge way yeah. that was surprising to me. Um, some other things do, and I'm always surprised by it. There's things that I really want to take off that don't necessarily do. We don't really <laughs> control that. So again, this is probably why I kind of avoid it, I guess. Yeah, sure. I don't really have control over that one. Okay. Um, the the next uh, my second pick is I mean I have to say um, I just picked movie posters by the way, <laughs> so I okay. didn't pick the, any other because I'm a big Star Wars fan. I love the recursives and the the like the 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 multiple layer um, Anakin for example and all of that stuff is really really great. But I just stick sure. to movie posters. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hereditary is the next one. I just pulled it ah. up for everybody to see. Um, how did this game along? How how did you like the movie first off? I. I adore the movie. I, I was happy to work with uh, Mondo and Ari on both mm -hmm. uh, Hereditary and Midsummer. Yeah. Um, and actually, Midsummer last summer was an amazing uh, work period because I was working on so many projects that were such um, dream jobs and of mm -hmm. such high caliber. Uh, Midsummer, all about Eve for Criterion, and I had just done Notorious for them, which was a, a super lifelong dream. Uh, uh, project so hereditary was something that you, it was by the way it you, was by the way you can also that, include you can also include midsummer because that would be my third piece <laughs> oh, okay that makes sense well i it's hard for me to think of hereditary without thinking of midsummer now in retrospect but but back then i had immediately um i'm a big horror fan mm -hmm. um and love the films and uh, was unfamiliar. This is Ari's first film, and I don't even think, um, I think he was already speaking of doing second projects after a hit. He was already in the middle of Midsummer, mm -hmm. and Hereditary had not even come out yet. And I think in some ways, creatively, that was probably a real boon to be able to go back into work. It, it certainly highlights comparing the two in a really positive light in terms of how different they are with each other, how similar and how bold they are. Uh, to have done them both kind of in the dark without public scrutiny is um, is really interesting. And I think lends a lot to the voice that they have to them. Um, I was blown away by Hereditary. It's a very disturbing film. It's um, it's more upsetting, I think, than Midsummer is to me. Yeah. There's just, it just but, strikes. But, uh, I, I just saw the other day, I saw the director's cut, the three hour long one or, or over three hours. Or, and or I mean, there for midsummer yeah there's some really crazy <laughs> horrible stuff in there <laughs> there is you know and that's that's something that i thought at first i'd, I'd seen the, the three hour cut and i almost it i was it seemed to go faster in some ways it seemed a shorter film but there was something about the added footage was it made things more explicit mm -hmm. and at the time i thought i really preferred it and was a real advocate for it but I think now that we've, I, th I we recently saw it again about a month ago, and mm -hmm. I kind of love the original cut. I think for that brevity and for that lack of kind of explicitness, it's easy to say because I, and now I've seen that movie, you know, many, 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 many times. So mm -hmm. I don't need it to be explicit to yeah. to express itself to me. So I love the subtleties of it uh, more, but. It's it's always interesting to see a director's cut uh, versus a theatrical release. Um, there's a there's a great story about Dead Poets Society that uh, my creative partner Ethan told me mm -hmm. when um, Weir was asked to do a like a 25th anniversary director's cut. His immediate response was excellent. I have at least 15 or 20 minutes to cut out of this movie to make it better. <laughs> and the studio 
uh, balked like crazy. They're like, no, no, no. Director's cuts are supposed to be longer. You're supposed to fill in more. We're, <laughs> we can't, re we can't reissue it with less. It's called and director's then, cut. I know. <laughs> and they, they killed the project because okay. he's like, no, I would cut it and make it, make it tighter. I wouldn't make it bigger. That would be the opposite. I'm not doing that. So yeah. they kind of, or we never got that cut from it. But I think it speaks a lot to what you were just saying about the impetus of how these director's cuts can be. And I, I don't, Sometimes you can cut it and make it smaller and it gets bigger. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a case with Midsummer, the more you add, the kind of the, there's a brevity that comes to that because a, a cohesion that happens that makes it feel somehow shorter in a strange way. So yeah. it, a, there's a weird trick of magic to that that I think is interesting. Um, I, I guess back to Hereditary. Um, <laughs> it was, I think both, both Midsummer and Hereditary were they were similar processes. Um, mm -hmm. Ari tells these very practical, very realistic narratives. They're, they're, they're very human people. They're very real places, but there's a, a symbolist and a kind of a dreaminess, a kind of an Arthur Rackham mm -hmm. kind of world that they're in. So you can interact the kind of dream qualities and the symbolism and with the tactical realities in a way that I think really work. And I think that's why we pair well. Uh, yeah, did, did you actually talk to him is it possible because when i talk to like other um artists who do like key art for movies and stuff like that they always talk to the agencies and they work it out but is it but do you have direct access or uh ari and i've communicated a little bit but after i think the work was done okay. it was mostly his reaching out and appreciating the you know really loved The process was really excited about Midsummer. Um, there, I have a great picture of him holding up mm -hmm. Hereditary. So we've kind of developed af after the fact of that. But you're right. Uh, a lot of times, and this is true in, in book cover worlds as well, even yeah. though you may know the author that you're doing a book cover for, the publisher does like to kind of keep everybody apart. Mm -hmm. And so that you're mostly, as the artist, working with the art director or the editor uh, with regards to the book cover. Um, and then they'll present it from their end to the author for approval or for input. Um, I think mostly to try to kind of keep, there's a lot of really good reasons for that. Uh, sometimes authors and artists don't get along very well. Sometimes yeah. there's divisions. Sometimes the author uh, will involve himself too much. And if there's a direct line to the artist, it starts to do an end run around the editorial process. So mm -hmm. it's not unusual for there to be a distance uh, in those stages. For film posters generally, and especially when you're doing large release ones or you're working with a production company, as you said, a lot of times you get hired by an art, by a, a second or third tier ad agency that has been given the license or tasked with the assignment mm -hmm. of making this particular aspect of the marketing rollout. You'll only ever really work with them. Sometimes uh, if it goes over well or the actor, or the directors, the people involved in the film really love it, you might get, you know, um, be made in touch with them after the fact, but it's usually after all the kind of battle is over and nobody can, can screw things yeah. up by over, you know. So that is pretty normal. I think most of my stuff has almost always been um, working specifically with whatever art director I've gotten assigned to, whether it's a Mondo yeah. project or anything else. And then the relationships develop after Okay, cool. Um, so let's, after the, the, my three favorite movie poster pieces, I have to say, uh, again, uh, let's jump into the real interview. And um, first of all, uh, you, you were born in Texas and you attended art high school. And uh, for all the people that want more background, check out the Criterion video. It's all in there. And, um, oh. but my, my question is, uh, do you remember your first project you did in art high school? And what was it? Project. <clears throat> I don't remember the first project necessarily. I mean, you know, you start off, you're a freshman in high school. It's probably still lives. I, I think there's okay. a few that I remember mostly because they were so painful mm -hmm. and unpleasant. <laughs> That's what you always remember, the unpleasant ones. <laughs> right? It's the ones where you're all gnashing your teeth together. You know, it, it's definitely a bonding experience. Um, I, I think one that we were that we were assigned to do that I remember us all kind of loving slash hating we we had to go out so at the time my high school has been moved into some new giant frank gary kind of super building in, mm -hmm. in houston but at the time 
uh, HSPVA was just a little building in the middle of an old neighborhood in um, uh, the West Village part of Houston, Texas. And so it was surrounded by all of these old houses. And Houston's not, not compare. I live in Massachusetts now where, you know, this town was originally settled in the 1600s. Yeah. Houston is a very new city. There's just not a lot of, like old is like 1920s. And then it doesn't really get much older than that. Old mm -hmm. really, I think generally is like 1970s or eight or 60s, you know? Yeah, so yeah. anyway, this- It's this Europe, is, Europe, I know, you know, I know, we have old buildings. <laughs> it's like ancient, yeah, it's totally different. So very new world down there um, and very new place. Um, but this neighborhood was had a lot of kind of old buildings and, and again, 1930s, 1940s. Mm -hmm. uh, not not extra, extravagant houses, more like worker homes mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is that they were doing back then. Um, we had to go out in the neighborhood and find a house and draw it, basically. Do a front face mm -hmm. elevation drawing of the house and the trees and all that kind of thing. Go back and, and you know do our doodles and then go back and finish the drawing in class. And then when we were done with it, then we had to take that same drawing and we had to we had to redraw it, but stretch it anamorphically, mm -hmm. just on the paper. And okay. then we had to stretch it tall. It was miserable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to have to draw like I, you know, there's not a lot of thrill in drawing just some random 1940s house yeah. front so, facing. Sounds um, like a and then like, to draw it three times was a little aggravating. Yeah. Sounds like a Photoshop job. <laughs> just pull it yeah. up easily. <laughs> It would have been lovely. No, this was, what was this, 1980-something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It must be 89. So, yeah, no, we were way, none of us had any of that. <laughs> of course, no, of course. Back then. So we had to do it all in our heads. It was, you know, for those of us who picked uh, houses that had nice stucco, flat surfaces, mm -hmm. they got off the seat. For idiots like me who picked these brick houses, oh, we were screwed. Man, yeah. And so it's awful. It, it. It was an opportunity. I, I still am not quite sure what the lesson was, other than just pain and, and <laughs> sadness. But it did bring up one of my earliest, and most I think all of us who were in those classes back then with our art teacher was uh, a, a negative syndrome that our teacher would scream and hit us about that she called mindless shading syndrome. Mm -hmm. She would come up. She was like, "Oh my God, you've got MSS. Stop drawing right now." And she would explain that mindless shading syndrome was when you had like large. So like my house had a huge couple of big old pin oak trees in yeah. front of it. When you just start kind of laboriously, kind of boringly, tree, tree, mm -hmm. tree, she would <laughs> slap you in the hand with a ruler um, because every mark had to be an intentional. Okay. Yeah. Interested mark. It didn't have to be interesting, but you had to be interested while you were doing it. That if you found a large area of gray, that even if it was going to be uniform and gray, that the that it needed to look alive. Um, you know, it's a lot like if you look at a lot of Ray Vanilla art or Travis Louie, even the areas where there is a just a very smooth, gradual gradation, it's lovingly executed. It's 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 interested in while it was being done. It's it's very mm -hmm. attentive and there's flow to it. It doesn't have to be complicated to be uh, mindful, but we all know when you kind of mindlessly shade in stuff, yeah, what yeah. it looks like. It's just it's just dead, and it looks dead, and it looks like you are bored. And if there's a boring part of your piece, the piece becomes boring as a result. And I, I have to say, for all the misery that went into that stupid house project, <laughs> mindless shading syndrome is. It's I still hear uh, Ms. Zaytoun yelling at me uh, over my shoulder while I was squiggling trees for the third time so it, it, uh, it did have its benefits sure. okay so shout out uh, to your teacher <laughs> it yeah, helped no, now it's been forever yep, yep okay um so now i want to talk about how you got um involved with ethan i mean i uh I means in day and meadowlark you did with him um yep. how, how did it happen and how how did you split the workload uh well ethan came he got in touch through a kind of an unexhilarating way, my his agent got in touch with my manager, and we set up a lunch meeting to get together to pitch this idea that he he had this screenplay that he had written uh, for Ende that was three hundred some odd four hundred pages long. And if mm -hmm. if you know anything, screenplays every page is supposed to be a minute. This is clearly way beyond the runtime of any legitimately yeah. doable film. Um, it's just there is such an excess of riches of history. I think he was having trouble getting it through. There's a lot of reasons why it's very hard to tell native stories here. 
um, a lot of excuses that are used for it. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't initially thrilled with the idea of it, it is a very common thing for a lot of people to push their screenplays through the medium of comics as a way to kind of sell it as a movie later. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be a part of that process. I'm a big comics guy and I love the medium and I don't think it's necessarily a healthy way to use it. Comics are not movie scripts. They're not storyboards. So I think that already initiates a little bit of confusion. Ethan, to his credit, did not have any of those intentions going in. And I made that clear when we sat down. And I, and I really just kind of thought it'd be fun to meet and have lunch with Ethan. I came down to New York. It's just about a couple hours south mm. from where I live. So I took a train down. I thought it'd be fun to have a quick lunch with Ethan. I didn't really expect anything from it. Um, we were going to meet. We were going to chat. And then I was going to get on a train and come back that same day. Uh, that 15-minute lunch turned into three and a half hours. And we just kind of got on like a house on fire right away. Mm -hmm. Brought some stuff down and some ideas that I had for NA, and it, we just kind of exploded um, uh, in there. And just, it was, I think I walked out of there and I called my manager up immediately and said, this is, it was a complete 360 from, from my attitude going in. <laughs> and we were absolutely doing this. This was so much fun. I felt like I found a real partner and crime in this. And we kind of spent the first couple of years ultimately having to take that screenplay and kind of explode it into a million bits to kind of invent and create and find mm -hmm. a new through line in order to tell this in a narrative way that made sense that it wasn't just a tick tocking through of history or yeah. a biography of Geronimo to find a narrative thread through. And that, that took us a good long while to and... just sitting on the floor and writing and scripting and going back and forth remotely mm -hmm. and is uh the uh, the workload i mean he he came up with the or he he got the script but you are also an author so how, how were you involved i mean you did all the drawings i'd say and then i mean yes. and he did the story or how were how much were you involved with uh the story as well uh, we both worked on the story this this story the book the graphic novel itself is in a lot of ways extremely different from the screenplay and kind of mm -hmm. had to be wasn't yeah. really tenable to do the screenplay as it was written. Um, so much about comics that gets forgotten with um, with an author is that, you know, the point of comics is to show when, you know, you, you prefer to show rather than tell mm -hmm. or to do both at the same time or to recognize that what you're showing frees you from having to tell about it. So it allows you to tell something else that's going on in the scene. You don't have a scene saying, and I picked up this gun and then you draw someone picking up a gun. It's redundant and stupid and boring. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you can start reminiscing about your relationship with your mother while you pick up a gun. And then it suddenly adds this weird layer of like, this guy's got this really fucked up idea about his own parent. <laughs> so it, there's just a lot of, there's a lot more to play with. And I think it was on me to kind of bring Ethan into the medium a little bit with regards to that. He is, you know, we both were from Texas. We grew up with a lot of Apache and uh, Comanche mm -hmm. uh, stories and narratives uh, from down there. So we, we had a little bit of a history to it, but he and uh, his, uh, one of his friends, Charles Gaines, had written this incredible amount of material about the history of the Apaches and Geronimo specifically. So for me, it was just an explosive learning curve uh, to start learning about who he was and, and the yeah. details, what to bring in, what to not. Um, there's also, um, I'm sorry, there's also in, the, I think, Ben Tobin, a master brush, dry brush it's master. Dry brush. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's also on, on Vimeo, if you want to check it out, people check it out. There's a lot of information on the comics part and how it, how it was sorry. made. So look into that as well. Sorry, I didn't yeah, want to very... interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's a good plug. Um, it's a great little film. Um, a local filmmaker made that. It was terrific. Um, yeah. It, it, I think, like, it was different. What got Ethan interested in me was he had found a copy of the Conan Born on the Battlefield mm -hmm. graphic novel with Kurt Busiek um, and said, oh, my God, I can see Enday now. I can see okay, another yeah. way forward. And I, I think different from that, whereas... I did get to work with Kurt. I did add and kind of tweak and work in the practical stages we go. Anybody who writes comics knows that the, whatever, however finished their script is, it's always just going to be a, a first draft. Mm -hmm. the, the real draft of the piece is the drawing of the page. It all changes. Uh, some authors are very deliberate. You've got your Alan Moores where every eyelash <laughs> is described and mm -hmm. com composed on every panel, and you just basically are 
are, are, are a horse of his stagecoach by his command. There's others where there's a lot more freedom to kind of go and move. And with Ethan and I, I think the partnership was different than the Kurt Fusick one in that we were both really, really back and forth involved. If There were no real mm -hmm. bad ideas on the table. We established a lot of basic rules um, for working with each other in terms of being very honest. And, and one of our metrics for always feeling like things are working well is that when we look back on the script that I think we both spend an equal amount of time on, I can't look at a line and recognize that it was mine or his. I just don't remember. It mm. just, I'll, I'll, we were just going over, I'm, I'm just about finished with the principal art on Meadowlark, our second graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And I was remarking on a, a line that I found in the script that we had also written on a very, very detailed page, panel by panel script to kind of guide us through it about this great interchange between this father and son. And I, and I was like, I honestly could not for the life of me, it seemed new to me. And I said, did you write this? And he goes, no, I think you wrote it. I was like, no, 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 I think... Did we, you know, and we couldn't <laughs> figure out where it came from, but there it was. And, and Just I become think one. Yeah, I think that's what really happens um, when that stuff hap kind of comes together. Drawing it is different. I, I have to draw it. It's a very solitary process. It's not something that he can do, mm. although he is always kind of on my shoulder while I'm doing it. And what I'll do is maybe work out a few pages, and then I'll immediately send those five pages over to him, and then we'll talk and kind of figure out tweak you know talk about what's working what's missing um it's right now it's he's acting more as a kind of a a cheerleader on the side of the road as okay. i work through this marathon you know kind of cheering <laughs> yeah. me towards the end because it's been so much work to get here and we're almost done um earlier on it was a lot of back and forth we're trying to figure out the characters what they look like how they behave you know when there's been scenes going through, there was a major character um, who ended up looking very different from how we both, I think, had imagined that he would look going in. It just somehow it didn't function given what he needed to do. Um, I'm trying to talk about it without spoiling. Um, <laughs> it, so it, it's having him around to be able to, when I get lost, to kind of have him act as a lighthouse really... Yeah. Uh, has been really essential and unique. And I've never, I've, I've done a lot of books with a lot of different writers and I've written some of my own. It's been the best kind of hybrid of the kind of agency, trust and relaxation that I'll have when I'm doing a, a book that's written and drawn by myself. But the partnership has been such a, just an absolute pleasure. I, I, I think that we were so in love with what, fun we were having with Ende when Ende was done and we were on book tour, it was inconceivable that we would stop <laughs> there. <laughs> and we had originally thought to do a second one uh, and we have an Ende 2 kind of drafted out. But I had this very tiny germ of an idea for a little crime story. And I just said, what do you think about this? Where is it going to go? Do you think this is something we can build on? He was like, oh, I like that. And it was basically like two kids in a, in a sandbox who... Yeah. Starting to put Legos in sand it's, and trying to build this castle. Together. That's how I imagine when I watched uh, The Mandalorian and a lot of stuff. Uh, Dave Filoni and John Favreau having like those toys and like playing with those toys to create in those stories. I mean, it, it is. I mean, it's it's a ridiculous thing, but it's a true thing that basically we're getting paid to be to play and and imagine like you did when you were a kid with your Star Wars figures or whatever mm -hmm. for a job. It's ridiculous and marvelous to be able to do that, but. It's really what it comes down to. We get to pretend and make up shit on our own, and then we get to sell it, and then we get to make it happen for real, and then we get to go to try to encourage other people to read it. It's it's mm -hmm. ludicrous on its face, <laughs> but it's, um, it's terrifically fun. And I've never I've never had a working partnership with someone that was so just natural and positive and fraternal. And we've become very close over the last few years um, uh, working on both okay. these projects. Perfect. Um, so let's get back to the movie posters. Um, what is or what was the last movie you uh, saw? First question. <laughs> the last movie I saw. Um, I did just recently see. I mean, I've seen Sunset Boulevard before, a long time okay. ago. Okay. Yeah. But I just recently saw that again, and I love it. It's a marvel, and I could talk about it for hours. Um, and we. Yeah. And. Uh, we, 
but it's not towards anything. That was just okay. me watching him. Okay, okay. You, yeah, yeah, that's 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 fine. That's fine. I'm, that's almost oh. my question. <laughs> and um, what is a must see movie that will come out soon? Is is there any stuff you want to see when the mo uh, when when you can go back to the cinemas? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was really, I, I am still looking forward to seeing Tenet. I, I, I'm, I'm oh, yeah, me too. It's Nolan. Um, I think my biggest excitement right now is probably for the new Dune films that are yeah. coming from Villeneuve. I adored Arrival. I'm a huge fan of his Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. loved Enemy. I am, I'm just, I was so excited to hear that he'd taken this on. I've, I am, Dune is one of my, um, just absolute most favorite novel series ever. Mm -hmm. And I okay. reread it every once in a while. I'm a super hardcore sci-fi nerd and a crazy Dune freak. So I'm very excited about it. I'm not, I'm not a fan in the way that where I require an interpretation of it to fulfill certain benchmarks that I need to see or uh, continuity mm -hmm. issues that I get all twisted up about. It, it can be completely different and wild and new, and I hope that it is. I mean, it um, looks nice on those those HD uh, uh, screens. <laughs> amazing, yeah. No, it looks. It, it will obviously look terrific. Um, it's. I'm. I. I do very much like the equally marvelous and also comically ridiculous uh, David Lynch mm -hmm. uh, Dune uh, Muppet <laughs> Worms were not a real success, but the design of the yeah. castle like Caladan and the uniforms and uh, the Harkonnen world and, and, and Arrakis that is just so incredibly well done and so well cast. It's a really high bar for him to leap over. But so far, it seems like he's really uh, hitting all the numbers. I just yeah. I'm kind of keeping myself a little distant from, as much as I can from it, uh, just so that I can see it clean and surprise. And we're living in a I think we suffer our spoiler world more than we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, more than is good for us, um, but I I already know the story so well. It's, you can't spoil it for me. Yeah. But I do. I'm very curious about how he's going to split uh, the two films. Yeah, over exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's an interesting way to do it. I think part of the problem with Lynch's film was that it's just it's just too big mm -hmm. uh, for a two hour film. It's probably better suited for a mini series on an HBO or something like that. Yeah. That said, the budgets don't suit that as well. It's a tricky property to try to make. Happen. I mean, it's when you look at Mandalorian. I mean, they made the eight uh, eight episodes, uh, and they had it looked beautiful. And I think oh, you sure you that. could do that. So you I can think... now. I mean, this is back. You know, I mean, Lynch is doing yeah Canada back then. Back then, that's and true. there was bad, and there was some really awful um, sci-fi network miniseries of Children mm -hmm. of Dune. I think that were just so goofy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, now, I mean, ever since I think Game of Thrones, you now realize like, oh, you mm -hmm. you tell these epic $100 million big budget kind of stories in on a small screen in that kind of series. And I, I, I would say of all the kind of moving picture kind of storytelling mediums, that's where my heart is the most. You, 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 there's so much more space to develop your characters, to tell your stories, to intertwine your narratives and now that you can kind of do anything you want with the CGI, there's the sky's the limit quality, I think makes it for a very exciting time in that medium. Mm -hmm. And I think it puts a lot of pressure on premium cinema films uh, to try to find out what their strengths are in comparative to yeah. that. It's, it's interesting. And uh, would you like to make, uh, I mean, you made the, the, the Paul character uh, with Tim Timothy Chalamet, uh, the, the poster or the portrait. Yep. Uh, would you like to yep. do some more of that? And, and would you like to do a movie poster for the movie? I would, I would die to do a movie. I, will, I, I think uh, all my friends at Mondo are just screening whenever they see my caller ID come up because they think I'm going to ask them. <laughs> Have you got that Dune license yet? Is it, is it coming yet? I would love to do it. I, okay, shout, shout out to Mondo. Please do that, Mondo. Get it. <laughs> Get it done. Yeah. They, uh, it, it really, you know, it's not always in their hands, so they'll do what they can, and they always have. I, The fact that they managed to pull off the Twin Peaks uh, license was not was still to this day unheard of um, yeah. and almost impossible to do. I, I think if anybody can pull it off, I think they can. Um, All right. So yeah, I have hope. a Chani poster. I have a Chani drawing that I I just I haven't had time to do yet, but I've got ready to go that I would like to do. I 
I did a series of portraits of the characters based on my interpretations from the novels directly about a year ago. Um, and that's up on my website. Um, I had always intended to kind of similarly reapproach uh, based on the Villeneuve um, film. And these are kind of a slow walk towards that. Um, it's, it's, I think if I didn't have anything else to do right now, I would definitely be doing that. Uh, uh, my energy and, and passion for it is there, but I think it's probably good to wait a little bit and see how things mm -hmm. develop and see how they turn. A lot of it's guesswork right now. Yeah. No one's really seen it yet. Um, I, uh, but another question, um, as, you, you, as you did the, um, the Timothy Charlemagne one, um, how, many, how many do you do of that? Is, it, is there... Like how many is, is there only one like an OG and you sell those because you sell them or you sold them on your side. Yes. So it's just one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't I, as a rule. And this is an important rule, I think, for people to understand is that it, it is as if you're making a piece of artwork, if I make a drawing of a property or a license or a subject that's not my own, it's perfectly fine to do it. Art is art. You can do anything you want with art. There's no problem. I think the trouble starts to come into when you start making print series or t-shirts, mm -hmm. you start making products out of it. And then yeah. you're absolutely have crossed over into the line where you're violating someone's copyright. And I can't really be someone who is also constantly fighting others, stealing my artwork to use it for subjects that I didn't authorize. And then to participate in that same sin in the other direction mm -hmm. seems a little bit too hypocritical for even me to stomach. So I'll, I tend to, with the 52 Weeks Project series, do only originals. Uh, the Twin Peaks stuff was all done only as originals. I never made any prints or products of them uh, on purpose, and that turned out to be a lot of why I was able then to get the license okay. from Showtime, CBS, and Lynch to do it. They, The internet is seen by all, and they, if you're an artist that's out there and you're making fan art or you're doing work on subjects or or book properties or films that you really love. Absolutely, just I, I always encourage people to go whole hog where their passion drives them. I love movies, I love drawing from movies, and I do it a lot. I will not make, it will always only be an original and stay in an original unless I do get a license to then go forward with that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that does happen. Um, the first thing I ever did for Mondo was this Daredevil piece Yeah. that I had done as a private commission. It was just an original drawing I had done from a guy that hired me to do a commission for him. Mondo saw it. They loved it. We turned it into a poster. Marvel and Netflix really adored it as well. Mm. And again, they also check to see whether or not you've been kind of fleecing them or feeding off of them by making posters and products of their stuff before. And it sometimes in a room, if there's a bunch of different ways to go, it'll be the thing that, that loses you the job or it okay. might be the thing that turns them off to you. So it's one of these things where you kind of get more access if you deny yourself the kind of short-term petty access that mm -hmm. a print run might do. So I won't make prints of any of these Dune portraits uh, unless I get permission. Is, is, is it going to happen, for example, if you get the license, uh, like in a later point, could you still go back or would you draw a different one? Is it, is, for example, the, the, the Paul one out? Oh, the question. Uh, no, if if we like. Or could I, could I there be a print of this one? That that's that's basically the question. There very well, there very well could be. I I had we had originally. Um, I think even Mondo had pursued the idea of doing a print series of my Game of Thrones portraits mm -hmm. that I had done. Well, yeah. um, it HBO got back and basically it was after the show had just. I think it was after they'd done principal photography mm -hmm. all the actors had scattered back into their homes across yeah. the world it was just like they just said this is going to be a, a licensing nightmare to get mm -hmm. likeness rights from every you know like it yeah, will yeah. it'll just kill us uh the twin peaks thing was done similarly where a lot of all that work was essentially already had been done it was easy to get uh character rights because i think they had kept it all through Lynch and CBS and Showtime. It was a very streamlined process and we were able to make that happen. Okay. So um, I would love um, to do a Dune poster, a big full color poster for the film. Um, I would also love to see the portraits get done as individual G clays. Mm -hmm. We had done a similar thing with that, with the Twin Peaks stuff through Static Medium. They made these amazing, um, almost completely identical print quality to the original uh, 
G Clay series through that. I would love to see that happen. That is possible for that to happen if that is something that everybody likes and agrees that makes sense or that it's just it just it depends a lot on whatever license structure they have with the studios. It depends on whether or not the individual actors have also signed away their likeness rights or mm -hmm. are willing to give that approval. Um, some notoriously do not. I know Jack Nicholson never yeah, uh, signed off on his likenesses, so you'll never see an official film poster that stars Jack Nicholson where it'll be his face. If you see his face in one, you know right away that it's not legit mm -hmm. or, or yeah. official in any capacity. So there are limitations with that, and I do try to... Um, I had a great idea for this shining poster I wanted to do and can't do it because his likeness is what is the structure of it that makes it work. Um, yes, I, it is heartbreaking to me and I would love to do that piece, but I won't because it doesn't, it, it runs in contradiction to his wishes. And I, I don't think that's ever my desire is to be uh, uh, parasitical with mm -hmm. regards to okay. some problem. So. I hope that'd be great to see these. Yeah, I would love to see. That I would love to see it as well. Because <laughs> there is a full color version of it that I have in mind that I, I'd like to do again. I'm, I'm crushing away trying to finish Metal Arc, so I'm not able to mm -hmm. attend to it. But I would love to do that, and I may do a color workup from it and put it online. Yeah. But I would never, you know, I could never make prints from it. And if I see someone else making prints or T-shirts from it, I, I always try to stop it. It's not. Of course, yeah. It. Of course. Yeah. Uh, everybody, by the way, there's a shout out to everybody. Please hit the report button, Facebook, everywhere. Stop this stuff. This can't be happening. This is very um, not fair to the artist yeah. and uh, the artwork. Yeah, and it's exhausting. And, and I think it is exhausting and impossible to keep up with it. Uh, there are places that are particularly bad about this. A lot of them are warehouses where they just mm -hmm. take in submissions and they post them so they can kind of skirt being responsible for them and they can shut it down. But so many bad Twin Peaks t-shirts um, through Redbubble or, yeah. or similar places like that, and we'll have them shut it down. And then literally seconds later, an identical listing from a different vendor pops up. So it's it's a very, very annoying. It's, a, it's an annoying whack-a-mole thing to do. And mm. I, I've had people come up to me at a show or a convention with a bootleg piece of art or a print for me to sign, and I don't, and I will not sign. Of course, yes, yeah, you shouldn't. But and I try to encourage them not to do it. Their perspective is, I can't afford the originals. This was ten dollars. It's just, it's a devil's handshake. I can't really. I understand why people do it. Mm -hmm. I understand why fans buy it. They shouldn't. It's not a mortal crime if they do. But it's all. It's never good for the artists and for the people that put their time and their work and their blood into the work that mm -hmm. they do, because it is it is theft. And yeah. and, and certainly I can't buy it. I know the money feeling. I didn't get my tax return yet. Otherwise, I would have bought something <laughs> from the store. <laughs> I just have the Thanos up though. It's a, it used to be in the back here, but uh, switch oh, yeah, it with right. the uh, switch it with the jocks. But uh, Thanos is over there now. So. Oh, I love those jock Star Wars things. And I think you've got like a Jason's uh, eyes without a face thing over there. Is that? Yeah, is that's that that's the Joker. Oh, excellent! That's oh, the Joker one, and on the other side, there's Baby Yoda by uh, Baby Yoda by uh, Ruiz Burgos. Oh, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I got his um, Marty Feldman, his uh, yeah. Igor from uh, Young perfect. Frankenstein. I, I love. I love Jason. It's amazing. Yeah, I got uh, I uh, over over there in my uh, next to my TV. I have a uh, um, like this ca like cal kind of calendar thingy where you can switch around, and I got they got all the faces on. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's oh, that's a... so cool. Oh, I love it. Yeah. No, and Jock stuff has been blowing my yeah. face off lately. He's he's amazing. I, I I was so glad to be able to meet him at at Monocon. Yeah. Um, and to kind of uh, chew the fat a little bit. I his Star Wars series are incredible, and it's still. He's he's the last word on the Punisher imagery as far yeah. as I can tell. That's what he did for Mondo. Was I also like the heat, like the cityscape from Heat. That was that was very yeah. amazing. Yeah, no, terrific, and uh, yeah, no, across the board. I, uh, Gabs, uh, the work that everybody's been doing. Is I know. Just, I, I used to have Gabs up here. There was there was a, there used to be a Star Wars set, the Gabs one. The, the, this came out lately, but I got now the John Armo one. I don't know. I, oh no! Nice. I'm, I'm going to show it to you. Are you? Do you know which one I'm talking about? This yeah. one. Oh, I've never seen that. No, I'm not familiar. Very yeah. cool. I I show you later, but yeah, <laughs> for sure okay. not yet. It's 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 a really cool set. I'll show you later. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot. Exactly, exactly. I have like about 100 pieces at home, but I'm up up uh, like 25. So, 
it's hard. It's hard. You got to keep rotating. I, exactly. I have a hard That's what I do. Time. I'm running out of wall space. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of favorite posters, because we uh, showed a couple now. Um, mm. Do you have a, a favorite poster right now? Doesn't have to be bought by you, but is there one out there you really like? And um, yeah. It's really hard. I, I love uh, Tula Lotte's um, handmade poster from Mondo. That thing just knocked my yeah. socks off when I saw it. Um, I just got uh, Tech Peter's inc incredible lino cut poster for Godzilla versus Mothra. Mm -hmm. uh, I have it hung up in our house. It is even my wife approved of it, which is shocking. Okay, I, crazy. I, yeah. so much stuff, not a I never expected that I would allow that I would be allowed to hang a Godzilla piece in the house. <laughs> it's up there um, in a place of prominence. Um, it, it's there's so much. It's there's so much coming out. There's so much being done well. The Godzilla series, yeah, that Mon just done. It was it was crazy, right? Very crazy and very hard to resist. I failed to resist some of them. Um, <laughs> which, which, was, what else did you get? I, I I was really thinking about the Oliver Barrett one. I really love that yeah. one with the Japanese lettering on top with the red one. So, oh, they look great. So good. Oh, they're all the Phantom City Creative ones were great. Yeah. I love Ken Williams's first Mondo piece. Uh, his Godzilla was amazing. I the Tom Whalen color thing. ones they were great. Amazing. Yeah, it was just all spectacular. I usually when you have group shows like that, the the metric is you usually get about fifty fifty really good quality stuff with some stuff that's mm. eh, not so much. This was. 90 10 i in fact yeah. I, and, and, and i'm not even sure what i would rate as a 10 it, it's it was all so surprisingly mm -hmm. shockingly good i'm so sorry they had to cancel that show from this um uh, pandemic yeah. but it was great that they put it online okay um i want to talk about your workspace uh we're gonna have some footage from the criterion video on it um i'll uh, put it in there and um yep. what what how do you is a structure to your workplace there is. So I we live in a small rural town in Western Massachusetts. Um, the house that we live in now it was the doctor's house. Mm -hmm. uh, it was built uh, late 1800s, um, and the building that I'm in right now and where my workspace is was his apothecary. Mm -hmm. uh, back then, the doctor, you know, he had a wagon. I think he was the first guy in town to actually have a wagon mm -hmm. uh, to go up to the various homesteads to attend to medical needs. Um, but back then, a lot of Victorian doctors, you came here. Uh, they made mostly, they did house calls. There wasn't a lot of hospital care happening at the time. Uh, sometimes you came here to give birth or whatever. It, mm -hmm. So this is basically his kind of pharmacy was downstairs. It's a two-story space mm -hmm. that I suppose if you drove two cars in tightly, that would be how big, I guess, the space is downstairs. Mm -hmm. We use that. I share that with my wife as a kind of a shared gallery Mm -hmm. um shop space that's that the open in the criterion video that's where you see the uh, this part right yeah so that's we have a, a yearly kind of open festival mm -hmm. we do a big open studio and um that is when you see a bunch of people walking around in that space that's just below where i work i mm -hmm. don't let people upstairs mm -hmm. um uh, generally to work i use i really try to keep this um as my own kind of little a nest that I can kind of come and hide in. It feels mm -hmm. like a weird tree house mm -hmm. that, that, that <laughs> to kind of live in. And that helps me kind of focus and concentrate and feel relaxed. Yeah. Uh, art making is really private exercise for me. Um, it's what keeps me, you won't see a lot of videos of me working just because I don't, I don't do, I don't, I don't love the performative requirements that go into mm -hmm. Uh, film drawing or public drawing. I, I've done that through uh, IMC and through other programs. Yeah. I'll do demonstrations and live stuff. The muddy, uh, the muddy uh, series. Muddy, what color. muddy colors. Yeah, they they had they yeah. have to do stuff there. Yeah, I did a video for them, and I'll have and I'll be doing some more for them as well. And and mostly it's Dan DeSantos and uh, kind of it's kind of forcing me forward to mm. do it. I like doing it when I'm doing it. I I'm always happy when it's done. I never want to do it again after it's over. Mm. <laughs> it's just a very weird yeah. psychology for me. So my space is really a kind of a private um, den. It's filled with taxidermy animals and mm. weird sculptures and just artwork that just lights me up. All the stuff that inspires me from Jeff Darrow originals and Edward Kinsella and Modena Kais and mm. some of my, I think behind me, you'll see there's a bunch of stuff yeah. that, 
was from uh, native art, and there's an old, um, you know, series of pictures that were kind of used when we got inspired by um, to do Ende. Mm -hmm. uh, the original Goseki Kojima, Lone Wolf and Cub, was a real inspiration point for how to tell Ende. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's there as well, you know, so it's really a lot of my records are here, you know, mm -hmm. it's just kind of my, my special. What does a desk look like from like, like looking from your perspective? Is there, is there structure to it to like all your pencils, brushes and all of that? Yeah. I mean, my, my, the computer that we're doing this from is mounted hard to the desk, so I can't move it around to show okay. you, but um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so, maybe we get a, uh, maybe we had a picture later, uh, like I'll put you know, it in. The yeah, Criterion thing shows it, but mm -hmm. there's just a big giant drafting table, uh, Kiki Smith's old drafting table that I managed to get from her in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, put a tabletop on it. Um, you know, I've got like an old piece of kind of Georgian uh, sideboard that I found at a flea market for 20 bucks that I used nice. to hold all the pencils and the ink and the drawers and stuff. And, you know, it's it's definitely like geared towards my area. I have a little couch and a coffee table for when I'm, you know, not drawing. I, mm -hmm. I get very regimented about when you're freelancing, it's important to really establish a structure when there isn't one. So I, I get up to go to work every morning. I stop, I try to stop every day at five or six o'clock to come over and dinner and yeah. family and all that kind of stuff. I don't work on weekends if I can, although right now I'm working every day. Um, I don't tend to do anything when I'm sitting at this desk that isn't either this or drawing. If I'm script reading or I'm, uh, talking on the phone, I'll, I'll always get up from here and go sit over on the couch so that there's just something about when you're in spaces that have specific purposes, you're better at those purposes when mm -hmm. you're in them. If this is only where I draw and work, when I come here, I tend to only draw and work, which is really kind of the point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I try to kind of keep things separated and, and I don't, when I'm done with work, I don't come back in here. Okay. Um, I don't come over the weekend i don't hang out uh with friends i don't this is not a lounge area this is a yeah. workshop this is your office and yeah your office basically you go to office, office. Mm -hmm. come, yeah you don't go to work unless you're there to work so right. i do i do have i have kind of created certain areas that are like that it's partially why i don't like to let people up here into mm -hmm. this part of the studio it's just it needs to be what it is and it helps me to kind of keep moving uh because there's yeah. a lot to do okay um so this is this is one of the questions I always ask, uh, like every uh, artist that comes on here. Um, which classical artist, or maybe an artist that has passed away, would you like to see a um, film make a film poster? Like for oh. like for example, um, in the first the first episode, um, Scott Saslow, he's a, he does a, like composition work, and he said uh, Caravaggio, for example. <laughs> Uh, well, that would be my, that was the first thought that came into my head was to do a Caravaggio. It's yeah. so cinematic. It's so <laughs> obvious, you know, it's a choice. And come on, Caravaggio, terrific. Um, I would love, since Caravaggio was taken, I guess my <laughs> second one would be, I would love to see uh, a Sukkot uh, movie poster or um, uh, Francis Bacon yeah, would be what, amazing. What, what franchise or what movie would he tackle? I would love to see Francis Bacon take on something that is counter to what he might normally do. So I wouldn't select a horror poster for him. Mm -hmm. I would say I would love to see Francis Bacon do Amelie or, you know, something okay. really like I'd like to see opposites paired together uh -huh. to a certain I'd love to see Kandinsky do a Star Wars, you know, like there, I, <laughs> there'd be really interesting shit that would come out of somebody yeah. being forced. Uh, to kind of take on something that is normally outside their wheelhouse. It might be a colossal failure, um, but you might get something really interesting from it. Okay, sounds perfect. Good answer. Um, okay. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I, I enjoy it. Um, <laughs> so um, to we, we're, gonna, we're going towards the end. So uh, one question is, do you have any tips for beginners when it comes to software, hardware, uh, social media, um, all the stuff you need? Yeah, there's a, it's... It is my my thing has changed about six times over since I started out mm -hmm. pre-internet times and I I even having grown up without it it's still there's a it's still hard to imagine a time without it now that we've mm -hmm. been so in it by and so needing of it I, I I initially would cold fax pitches to editors at comics companies using a fax machine mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it, it is 
what I know is old man dinosaur stuff, I guess, comparatively. <laughs> These days now, and it's all changed again. So now with the coronavirus, um, I would say that websites, and I, I wrote an article about this on Money Colors as well, um, the internet is, as we all are finding, our almost only way of kind of interacting with others and the world these days. Um, if you haven't already, if you're an artist and you haven't already got a website going, oh God, please get on it right now. Um, there's lots of different places uh, mm -hmm. uh, to Squarespace or Wix is one that I use that have very yep. easy to use templates to build your websites. I mm -hmm. built mine from it. I'm able to manage it and use it and exploit it for the times for a new drawing series I want to do. Um, social media is a lot of work. It's a now a necessary evil if it's seen that way um, as an evil. It you, It is important to do. I think it's essential to do. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of artists that are starting out. Um, I know a lot of editors who kind of whisper that they always look for you online. And how you show yourself online mm -hmm. shows to them broadcast how serious you're taking it. So making the mistake of not having a real website, but having like a Facebook page or a MySpace page or whatever, if that is even around anymore, <laughs> it, it, it immediately broadcasts to an editor, an art director, how professional you are. Yeah. Uh, if you have your own website and a very simple, easy to navigate portfolio, it goes so far with these guys in terms of getting them to take your work seriously, take you seriously, see your production level, mm -hmm. see your portfolio uh, quietly without you sitting in front of them, nervously fiddling with your thumbs while they're looking at your work in a <laughs> live portfolio setting. It's really, really essential, really, really important to do. Um, I think, I mean, uh, the uh, Jeff Kinney, who did Wimpy Kid, that was mm -hmm. a web he was making for himself if it wasn't for charlie um kochman my friend and an amazing editor over at abrams seeing his work at his website that he was doing for yeah. free and then bringing him over you know like he made that happen because jeff showed up he was making the work for the work's sake he was posting it on his website and it was seen by an editor and then the rest is this mega empire that he's created uh since then it it is not what usually happens, that level of success, but the road towards those things happening, whether it's Kazu's um, books through Scholastic that mm -hmm. were drawn from his websites and then repurposed into book mode, it is the, the internet is the place to do these things. And I think more and more as conventions are going to change, I think a lot of them are probably not going to return mm -hmm. as a result. Yeah, sadly. And think, yeah, and the ones that do... Um, I don't know how they're going to function in our new normal that we have going forward. Um, it's going to, it has already altered and it's going to continue to alter how we interact with the world out there. Um, it really, at the end of the day, it's you like social media, you need to keep, you need to work every day at what you do. You need to keep making work. You need to post it. You need to share it. You need to participate, share and post other people's work and interact on a daily basis to make social media function. Not just the algorithms that kind of uh, highlight those that participate every day on it over mm. those that don't, but it's that those principles are the same in art making. It's one of the reasons why comics has been such a essential and important part of my development. There is, I think comparatively, like the amount of pieces that I'll make for a children's picture book, a 40 page children's picture book, is about five pages worth of comics. Mm. And uh, these graphic novels, I think Meadowlark will probably be about 260 pages mm. when we're all done. It's an enormous amount of work. It's, it's a yeah. gargantuan, insane, smash yourself with a boulder kind of amount of work. But it's through that process of just cranking through the, that work, you always come away from it better, smarter. Your, your, your skill set gets better. Your yeah. understanding of how you work and what you see through narrative gets smarter. It's just work makes more work. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, and I also have some uh, Instagram questions and uh, shout out to Apo, who's a friend of mine. Uh, he's a really big fan. As I, as I told him, uh, I'm gonna talk to Greg, and he's like, "Oh my God!" His, he like sent me this mind exploding <laughs> emoji. And uh, so I, he he gave me like eight questions or so, but I'm gonna pick uh, pick one good one. Um, sure. uh, first first one would be. Um, 
do do you work for ex for example with your double exposure um, uh, uh, art? Do you work with Photoshop, or how do you involve it somehow? Is it or how do you do that? No, I, I I do scan and archive my work digitally. You know, like once the piece is done, I will I have a large format scanner. I'll scan it in mm -hmm. and I'll keep it in that way. And and of course, when I put it on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, that's how that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll use Photoshop for those pieces to crop and maybe clean up smudges if I see things that are there that I don't like. But mm -hmm. otherwise, it's really just trying to make them as native to the original as possible and serve it to that. I, I don't, my Photoshop skills are pervasive, but they're mm -hmm. really limited to, I think the best way to summarize it is that I only use Photoshop in the way that one might use a darkroom for photography. Yeah. I don't, I'll adjust I'll flip and cut and paste and assemble. I do all my comics pages in Photoshop, but I don't use it to draw. I don't okay. I don't like drawing digitally. I don't I think the effects and the filters that you do, I think if there's a filter for it, then I think that there's a reason to not use it mm -hmm. uh, because I think it immediately it standardizes your work. Really great artwork comes I think from the accidents and from the practical mm -hmm. interaction have with your materials and there's a glass wall between you and whatever you're digitally creating okay. at least from my perspective yeah. that i don't enjoy and i find dumbs my work down when i do it so i always try to do things practically so no the double exposures uh came out of a series of experiments that i'd done when i moved out of semi ink into graphite mm -hmm. was how to like Oh, look, I can make things look blurry with the graphite, with pencil and smudging. So I used a Doctor Who portrait series to try to see how blurring and focus and depth of field that you would have as an option in, say, your Nikon camera mm. in a well, drawing. I think that would be interesting to see if I could mechanically do that. Um, the kind of double exposure narrative stuff was just something that kind of grew from that. Mm. Um certain degree um i've always been a big fan of vivian mayer's kind of inadvertent double exposure photographs that she mm -hmm. would take um but those i found those while i was doing these it, it just it just was something that clicked um while i was working on it it's it allowed me i think in a lot of ways to bring a narrative a comics narrative into a single piece so Rather than have a single portrait just be the person, it's, it could be their story. It could be, it can involve images from where they've come or what their arc is or what their character expresses themselves in whatever subject matter it is, whether it's invented or a book cover or a, a Dune piece or a Star Wars piece. It allowed more storytelling to happen. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I think whatever I do, it's almost always about story for me. Yeah. Um, so the double exposure was really more practically a way to kind of have storytelling be part of a single image okay. piece rather than a Photoshop. Yeah, great. Because um, he did he did also a Blade Runner uh, 2049 uh, piece and he, he, he did some drawing for that. And he's also asking if there are any other uh, beginner's tips like to or, or online tutorials that you would recommend on how to improve or is that just drawing, drawing, drawing? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there is a lot. I mean, I teach, and so I'm not going to not advocate for teaching and learning in yeah. that kind I'm of I'm a part. teacher as well, so yeah, I know the yeah, feeling. It's important, I think, and it really rockets you forward, and it, it, it provides you with a lot that you can't otherwise get. That said, does that mean it has to be in an academic setting? No, of course mm -hmm. not. Uh, there's a lot of different options to suit your lifestyle for that, whether it's through smart school and online courses, whether, and again, coronavirus uh, killed this year's IMC. Mm -hmm. That is a magical, amazing environment in Amherst with having all those artists kind of living and working 24 seven for a full week on top of each other with, you know, these giants like Greg Menchess and uh, Donato Giancola and um, Mike Mignola and Scott Fisher mm -hmm. and Rebecca Gay and, and, and Boris Vallejo. They're all like walking around and working. You, you cannot compare in my life. I've never been in an environment that was more, exciting and supportive and nurturing and thrilling than that physical space. Okay. So there's a value to that. Um, as for tips, I, I was largely self-taught. I did go to an art high school. I did go to Pratt. Mm -hmm. um, but I, the work that I do now and the work that I did privately was always the work that was the most important to me. I, 
was not supposed to do comics at Pratt. I was at a fine art painter and it was mm -hmm. a, you know, everything was about kind of Terry Winters tar and abstract expressionists. And it was very specific. So I secretly did comics and showed them to my drawing professor when class, when all the students had left because the ramifications yeah. and the explanations that would come from it were not good. So a lot of the stuff, I think it's important to pay attention to the stuff that you're doing when no one's looking um, and to work on that as much as you can. If you see artists that you like, I think that there's a lot to learn from copying them to the point of your own boredom and then move on and do something else. I don't think it's healthy necessarily to lead or to be a second string um, imitator of some other artist for your career. Um, I, I see a lot of students that come up and say, the, I, I got hired by an editor because they couldn't afford to pay your rate, but they could afford to have me copy you for mm. a lesser amount of money. And it's an opportunity for that person and it's their first gig and I don't blame them for taking it on, but it's a dangerous dance that you yeah. start to participate in when you're building the blocks of your career on the stylistic Effects of someone who already has it. It just, it doesn't ever, I don't think there's anything wrong with mimicry of other people's styles as a lesson, but it, it, its value is only present if you discard it mm -hmm. as a, as a step towards you finding your own voice. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing I think that you can do as an artist is to really, we, all of us are still struggling to truly understand our own voice, to shape it, to change it, to roll with it, to keep it alive, to keep it moving. I think you need to do what contributes towards that exercise. And I think when you do stuff that doesn't or runs counter to it, it doesn't service your career, it doesn't service your, however mm -hmm. you wish to kind of work as an artist. I don't think it, it gives you the long legs you think it does. I don't discourage students from copying work that I do or, or copying Mike's work or, 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 or Scotty's drawing style. I think there's a lot to learn from that again, but um, there is a point where you need to kind of let that go. I don't also think that a really expensive $20 pencil is going to be a better drawing tool for you than a, a, a 50 cent Ticonderoga HB2. Mm -hmm. you, it, you can get a stick and make a drawing, get a stick and make a drawing. I, I'm not a snob about materials. And in, fine, in fact, I find that when my paper is too expensive, I will not draw well on it because I get too worked up, like going, oh my God, this is- Yeah, it needs to be perfect, yeah. It's <laughs> terrible. So I, I do, I actively try to keep my materials um, very pedestrian in that way, because if I can't, in the middle of it, realize that it sucks and not working, and I can't just crumple it mm -hmm. up and throw it up my shoulder without a thought. It's the wrong place to put your expectations when it comes to that kind of thing. So, um, I think you work with what you can get a hold of. I did an entire graphic novel with big pens. Mm -hmm. All the <laughs> drawings now are just pencils. I mean, it's, this is nothing yeah. that you can get from an office supply store or hell, even the grocery store. Yeah. So. Speaking, Here's what you got for you. Yeah, speaking of ballpoint pens, uh, I love your recursive series that you did. It was like really great. And especially uh, this, the Star Wars ones. Oh my God, they were so great. Oh, that was so fun. That was also canceled by coronavirus, but they were doing, it was for Mondo's yeah. final house party show. And I was, exactly. I was so happy to be able to do those. It's so freeing. It's such a nice exercise to loosen up first thing in the morning. Um, yeah, thank you. I, okay. I, that was a weird funny thing to do. And I, I had a very nervous relationship returning to ballpoint pen because yeah. I had, we had a bad breakup. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I swore I would never do it again, but it, I, I think you, being 20 years away from sudden gravity in that book made me realize I'd gotten, I had changed enough where I could kind of pick it up again and use it in a way that was new. And, and, mm. and that those recursive drawings, that simple rule of a, a continuous line, it, it immediately starts to undermine. There's a natural kind of detail and kind of mm -hmm. preciousness in the ballpoint pen that is easy for me to fall into. And the kind of rules that don't let me do it, that require it to kind of flow, work. That said, I do, I'm do. i doing them less and less now because I've kind of figured it out. I know how to, it, it's, it's, it's starting to become, you know, once you understand the, the, the combination to the lock, 
opening the door stops being mysterious and then mm. it's, it's becomes a technique rather than an art thing. So I'll, I'll do more recursives for sure, but it's, it's a lot like I'm doing less and less of the double exposures or I, I do less and less of these kind of blurry kind of pictures just because I want to try to do something new to kind of keep things fresh. If I can. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's what you're doing. That's uh, what I really like about it. I mean, you changed through when when you look through on your web page uh, through all the uh, illustrations you did. Uh, they're all different in style, and I really love that about uh, your artwork. Thank you. Thank you. It, it just it it always helps feed everything going forward. The recursive stuff. I may never do a recursive thing for a professional project, yeah. but what I learn from it will absolutely feed. Of course, yeah. Uh, professional projects i'm doing um i have i have to do a poster for mondo for the solo star wars movie and mm -hmm. um you will have of, to do or you did well i'm supposed to i've okay. I'm late doing okay it, so I say, okay okay because yeah. they're like dude where's that solo drawing <laughs> that i really am looking forward to doing and i'm so excited and we're all approved to go ahead i just need to do it but i'm finding that a lot of the kind of looseness of the recursive stuff is feeding into how i'm drawing uh han and chewbacca and this kind of mm. imagery that we're using so it's and it's making me rethink some things so i i think the best art comes from when you're a little bit nervous mm -hmm. uh, and i think it's always really good advice as somebody to chase things that scare you um it makes you when you're off balance you tend to act instinctively and i think that that makes for a more interesting journey towards a solution than if you lean on comforts. I really know how to draw horses, so everything I do has a <laughs> horse. You know, like that kind of shtick can get really dull and it can make you feel bored with what you're doing. And I, it's a lot of reason why uh, Ethan and I did Meadowlark instead of Ende 2. Mm -hmm. um, between the two of them, we felt like as much as, Ende was a terrifying, a needle to thread, and I still can't believe we managed to pull it off. Doing it a second time was less terrifying because we kind of we 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 decoded it and figured out how to do it well. Mm -hmm. Metal art was personal and and something that was about us and about our experiences with our at the time fourteen year old sons and struggle. We were all the four of us were all having with each other, and it scared the shit out of us uh, to chase it. It seemed ludicrous. But our editor, amazing Gretchen Young at, at Hachette and Grand Central, actually was like, no, we'd rather do this than mm -hmm. another. And like it was, it's great to be encouraged and supported to do things that are scary yeah. for you. And Metalark was a terror. It, it's still scary to me. There's still stages of these final pages that I have to do where I have no idea how I'm going to do the things that I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what both keeps me up at night but also makes pulling it off or at least getting halfway towards uh, uh, an idea of a victory so exciting and feels so gratifying when it, at the end of it when it's done. Um, to, to do something terrifying and to succeed with it is so much more rewarding than I think mm -hmm. when you're playing it and hugging uh, stage stuff. I, I always loved, like I'm a huge kung fu guy, Yeah. I love me too. I love all of the all of the movies. Crazy Shaw Brothers in my whole childhood. Did you and watch? Loved... By, by the way, did you watch the um, the the was it? A, I think it was a documentary the uh, on Netflix. What was it called? Where they compare like I think from Wu Tang to something. Oh no, I didn't the... see that. I, I I think I know what you're talking about. I don't know what it's called, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there. You know, I I there's something about. That kind of thing. I, I'm a, more of a samurai uh, movie oh. fanatic mm -hmm. than I am kung fu. I love them both, but my heart really is in the old black and white samurai films, the <gasps> samurai trilogy or Satoichi mm -hmm. or any of that stuff. And I guess the reason why I'm bringing these up, the the way in which these fights go through, I love the choreography of mm -hmm. a kung fu fight scene, but I I also if that's in the middle the samurai fights that are always responsive and calculated and mm -hmm. like a chess match where the action happens only after. Yeah. Um, I know what you're saying. It, it, there's a very on the site kind of spontaneous responsiveness mm -hmm. to that, that I find I really love. And on the other side of that is a messy, chaotic Indiana Jones kind of fight that I, I've always <laughs> loved the way he fights because he really doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Yeah. 
He has no idea what's happening. It's, I mean, he's a professor. He's a lot. That's right. He fights and wins via luck and, and his ability to spot opportunities to to not be defeated or to mm. die or be punched in the face. And so it's messy and chaotic and you don't know where it's going to go and he's barely hanging on. And so that kind of conflict to me is interesting and much more, it makes for something that is much more exciting because when the principals don't know what they're doing and get there, the, um, the result is so much more dynamic and so mm. much more alive. And I, and I bring that back into art making because I think that's, that's when things really start to happen and are things that are really interesting. Mm -hmm. When I was in Pratt and we would get assignments, we were like, you're doing a figure drawing. And then they would say, okay, you have 30 seconds. Go, you know, you, you only had 30 seconds. And then he'd say, stop drawing, you know, at the end of an incredibly short amount of time yeah. to capture what you're supposed to do means you're reduced to just capturing the essences of, mm -hmm. of what you're seeing as opposed to the surface and the details of what's there. I, I've always keep holding those kind of lessons close to my heart because they really inform, even when there's stuff like a graphic novel where you're having to basically do a very kind of regimented mono style, you have to be very consistent, you know, mm -hmm. just tell your story and not let your art get in front of the narrative you're telling. There's still room to be frightened and scared and be surprised the compositions the, the technique that you've applied has to be locked, but what you do with the technique can be filled with accidents and mistakes. And this book, more than any other I've ever done, is filled with scenes that completely change from the way we script it just because visually mm -hmm. there was some weird notion that came along or the idea of, of trying to, since the story takes place in, in a single day, to show the passage of time and the sun setting through the lighting and flat colors, how does that look and work? It scares the shit out of me, but there's a way to get there that I think hopefully works. And even if it doesn't work, I always enjoy the failures done in experiments more than the successes done in safe zones as a result of it. I have a lot more respect for a piece that yeah. flopped but tried to grab the moon than one that was much more pedestrian in its approach. All righty, perfect. So uh, to round it up, uh, now it's your time, or you have the chance to shout out artists, people, whoever you want. Uh, and... <laughs> it's it's so hard to do. You're asking me to pick my favorites. I know it's I, like I, it's like an Oscar thank you uh, uh, acceptance speech. I, <laughs> I I I love. There's so. I mean, my my studio is surrounded by uh, new artists like Ravina Kai that I really adore and love, and uh, and Edward Kinsella and. Um, uh, Jeff Darrow and uh, I, you know Scott Fisher. I have Rebecca Gay piece in here. I, I love Greg Manchess and um, Alan Williams. One of my favorite drawings that I own is this amazingly weird Alan Williams monster tentacle thing that I just yeah. I look at every single day. I love Jeffrey Allen Love and the stuff that he's working out uh, lately. I love the working in the movie posters has opened me up to all those guys. Rory Kurtz. Blows yeah. my socks. Oh, all Rory Kurtz, yeah. Yeah, I just, I love seeing what Gabs puts out and I love having relationships with them and seeing the work that they're generating. Um, I just, there's this, the, the internet has been such a gift for being able to mm. discover real time working active artists. I think one of my obsessive favorites right now is Aaron Wiseman. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a bunch of, I just received another. Uh, etching of his that I haven't framed yet that I just I adore his work the kind of places that he puts me into it's not really my it's not really how I would do something and I love mm -hmm. like uh, Tech Peter's lino cuts I don't I don't know how he thinks like that and yet I adore having that work around me Yuko Shimizu is one of my all-time favorites and having one of her originals that I actually the hereditary drawing that I did for that poster mm -hmm. I traded her for one of her pieces that I wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> that she did for a Folio Society book that she had done. Um, that was such a, it was such a delight to be able to have that piece and have that relationship with a piece that I've done. But mm -hmm. just to, be able to see someone's craft like that, I don't work like that. I don't think like that. And it constantly makes me 
question why not. So I love surrounding myself with art and artists that are surprising to me or not at all my bailiwick, whether it's, um, and, uh, you know, uh, Justin Gerard mm -hmm. or, um, I, I, I don't even know how to pick from whom that I'm doing. They're just not, you know, even just, Donato. Just do name dropping now. <laughs> <laughs> just throwing out everybody I can. Because, of course, when this is done, I'll think, why did you say them and not them? Why didn't you say Annie when you could have said Bill? And, you know. <laughs> okay, um, so all the other artists, please don't be offended if uh, Greg didn't mention you. But um, people can find you on uh, gregthings.com on your website and find your store and all uh, the artwork you did. So check that out if you want to own a... Uh, uh, an AP or an original Greg Ruth, it's worth it, I tell you. And um, they uh, can uh, you, they can also find you on Instagram at at Greg Things. I think Greg Things, right? I think that's it. Yeah, I don't remember at Greg Things or at Greg Ruth. I think that's my Twitter handle. Yeah, Greg. I think Twitter. Greg Things it is as well. So yeah. If you just Google, yeah, if you Google Greg Ruth, it comes up. Exactly. Okay. Thanks for stopping by again. It was a real pleasure to, pleasure to have you. And thanks to all the listeners out there. Tune into the next episode and don't forget to subscribe and uh, also look uh, over to the podcast and on our IG page at Drop Mac Official and leave us comments or shout outs, topics, questions for our next show. <laughs>